I want to take one little segment of Tulsi talking about foreign policy and just comment on it because I think it's I think it's wacky. This is no hero of uh, a foreign policy, certainly not my kind of foreign policy. So here we go. Tulsi Gubbard in an interview with John Stossel, I think on Reason TV. You met with the dictator, with Assad. Yes. And the liberal media give you grief for that. I would think that they would say we should talk to everybody. Now, Stossel believes that. And I'll talk a little bit in a minute about why that is so wrong. Talk, then wage war. I agree. You would think that's you, what they would say. <laughs> Chris Cuomo, you need to acknowledge that Assad is a murderous despot. Are you surprised? And then, and then what? I think this. But, but I mean, all Chris Cuomo said, you got to acknowledge that he's a murderous despot. Well, you can acknowledge that and then decide all kinds of things. But that's reality. That's truth. That's just what it is. So did you see the way she looked when, you know, and then what? And then you should think about how do we deal with motorist despots? And is talking to motorist despots the best policy? And when in all of human history is mo talking and negotiating and compromising with motorist despots ever helped us, ever been a good idea, ever benefited the human race? ever benefited America, which you claim to represent. So she rolled her eyes at he's a murderous despot. That's just a fact of reality. He's a murderous, barbaric despot, totalitarian. And you represent a country that represents freedom. You go speak to him for what? What is there to be gained? By the good negotiating with evil. By, and, and we're talking about not just the good. The good that has within it the mightiest military force in all of human history. The biggest economy in the world. Some of the wealthiest people. What is the point of talking to a despot? Now, this is the criticism I threw at Donald Trump. Right at Tulsi. She's the same. Pure pragmatism, no principle, no idea of what actually drives the world, the evil that exists out there in the world. You do not, cannot, should not ever negotiate with evil. Let's keep going. The problem is, you know, we look back to examples uh, like Roosevelt meeting with Stalin. Was that a good idea? Did the U.S. support of Stalin during World War II, was that a good idea? I don't think so. I don't think so. Wouldn't it have been better for the Russians and the Germans to fight it out? Who did we benefit by supporting Stalin? Who gained by us supporting Stalin? Eastern Europeans who were then enslaved under communism for 70 years? The Russians who were enslaved under Stalin's rule? Who did we benefit by talking to Stalin during World War II? Wouldn't, maybe, Germany had been even more depleted if they'd gone further into Russia? If they'd gone further fighting rather than allowing the Russians to defeat the Germans? Why not stay out of that war and let the Germans and the Russians fight it out? You don't help your enemy. The enemy of your enemy is not your friend. The enemy of your enemy is not your friend. Here's another example. Another murderous leader. You look at JFK. Oh, by the way, she admitted he was murderous. A meeting with Khrushchev. Nick was that a was that a good thing? Nixon meeting with Mao. There. Was that a good thing? Nixon meeting with Mao. A, put, a, 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 a Motorist leader who has had the blood of 40 to 60 million people in his hands? Or Khrushchev? Probably sustained the communism in, in, in the Soviet Union for, for decades, the fact that we had detente with the Soviet Union. I mean, Ayn Rand was horrified by the idea that an American leader would meet with a Soviet leader. And she thought it was horrific that Nixon went to China. 
examples throughout our country's history of lead Reagan meeting with Gorbachev. Leaders. Well, big difference. Gorbachev was winding down the Soviet Union. Gorbachev was winding down the totalitarian nature of that regime. But granted, I'm not sure Reagan had a meet with Gorbachev. To recognize that in the interest of peace and security, you have to be willing to meet with leaders of other countries, whether they be... Because they'll all keep their word. Because deals cut with barbaric leaders like that are always going to be followed. Because, I mean, she doesn't use the example of Chamberlain and Hitler. And a million other examples throughout history. Peace agreements with Yasser Arafat. Deals with the Iranians. She, she loves the Iranians, by the way. She thinks we, we should uh, reduce all of our uh, crippling economic sanctions on them and allow them and negotiate. Which, you know, I, again, I think she's very much like Donald Trump in, in this attitude. Series friends, dictators, or otherwise recognizing what you just said, that the only alternative to that is war. Is it? Is it always the only alternative is a war? What about just ignoring them, like Syria? What I said at the time was, Syria is none of our business. There's no uh, American interest involved. If ISIS is a threat to the United States and destroy ISIS, you don't have to get involved in the Syrian war. You don't have to send American troops. Just ignore them. War is not, it's not like the only two alternatives, and this is true in North Korea as well. The only two alternative is war or negotiate with barbarians. Again, more altruism, more moral relativism, more there's no objective standard for goodness, more false dichotomies, false alternatives. Wait a second, ignore, I've, I've talked about Hong Kong. I don't say ignore Hong Kong. I don't think you send troops to Hong Kong. But you don't ignore Hong Kong. You give moral courage to those in Hong Kong fighting for freedom. But in Hong Kong, they're fighting for freedom. What were they fighting for in, in Syria? Nothing. One group of barbarians fighting another group of barbarians. Hong Kong is completely different. But again, even in Hong Kong, you don't send troops. And yeah, I am heartless. I don't believe in sacrificing the lives of American kids, American soldiers, for the sake of other people's freedom. I wouldn't have intervened in World War II in order to save Jews from the Holocaust. I would have only intervened in World War II if it was deemed necessary for the security of the United States of America. You don't intervene in Syria unless the lives or property of Americans is at stake. The American government is there to protect the rights of Americans, not to be the policeman of the world, not to bring security to the world, not to bring freedom to the world. In Hong Kong, a moral, moral support, assertive statement, and telling China there will be consequences to them invading Hong Kong or doing horrible, you know, killing people in Hong Kong. Consequences that can be boycotts and, and, and others that do not necessarily involve, that do not involve military force. But you don't, it's not always a war. That's not always the, the alternative. That's ridiculous. Now, sometimes you have to go to war. Sometimes you need to bomb people into the dark ages. And I'm all for that. I don't believe in building democracies. I don't believe in keeping troops on the ground forever. But, again, libertarians and Tulsi and Donald Trump are presenting the alternative as we talk to dictators or we go to war. No. I mean, North Korea, you can ignore. We've already completely barricaded them, you could increase the, the, the economic sanctions, you could increase all kinds of other sanctions, you can encourage the people to rebel, you can support any kind of insurgency within the country, you can declare that, and if they threaten the United States militarily, you can crush them and turn them into dust. Nobody fights to win anymore. But that's a great tragedy. That's a great tragedy. All right. Um, Maybe a little bit more here, and then I've got some super chat questions. Don't so ask any more. What's going on with your party? Democrats used to be the anti-war party. Unfortunately, this is something that crosses both parties. And I yeah, the problem with this is, and I'm going to stop here because I, I think this becomes non-essential because it becomes politics. The issue's not 
pro-war, anti-war. This is why do we go to war? When do we go to war? For what do we go to war? Do we go to war to defend American interests? What are American interests? How do you define American interests? Those are the issues that foreign policy has to deal with, and those are the issues nobody, 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 nobody is talking about. And this is why, I mean, if you really want a deep understanding of this, I recommend you read um, Winning the Unwinnable War. Uh, that was edited by Longiorno, and I have three essays in that book. And, and just read Longiorno. Read his books, read his articles, follow him online. Um, he has the right conception of foreign policy, which none of these other people do. And nobody in the libertarian world has. All right. Um, what we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. using the super chat and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time so I'll do it again maybe we'll get some more today um, if you like what you're hearing if you appreciate what I'm doing then I appreciate your support uh, those of you who don't yet support the show please take this opportunity go to yourunbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com yourunbookshow and um, and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next.